have some time for questions. And I will, uh, I wanted to begin, um, Natan, with, uh, I guess I'd like to ask you to draw out the last statement you just made, which um, is hinted at a bunch in your book and, and now also in your, in, your, in your talk on your sociological theory of human rights. Um, uh, you, you, you're very clear that Arendt uh, disdains the kind of universal uh, human rights, uh, kind of abstract human rights, and you you have this uh, you, you you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that uh, and near the end that human rights is grounded for her in a dystopian idea of the fear of human rights are violated. Um, and there there is this is is the argument here that that human rights emerges sociologically in the sense that it it comes through over time as people get more and more used to the idea so that it becomes customary, mm -hmm. almost? Is that, is that what you mean by a sociological theory of human rights? Um, amongst others, I mean, I'm, I speak here also <clears throat> as, as, as part of the profession that I, that I am, as, as, as a sociologist, and we, we sociologists have, have enormous amount of problems with, uh, with, you, with the concept of human rights. Because sociology doesn't know how to deal with it. Sociology is about human groups, it's about interests, it's about power. And human rights is sort of like it's about universalism, it's about morality. So when sociologists deal with human rights, they either deal with human rights organizations and do a kind of organizational sociology of that, or they deal to, uh, um, based on kind of Marxist and neo-Marxist thought to show how human rights are, is, is a liberal ideology which covers up like uh, uh, other things if you think of Noam Chomsky's uh, 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 um, uh, thinking about human rights. What, what I wanted to do through her, which is kind of also paradoxical because you know, she, she, she really resented the social sciences and thou, thou shall not commit social sciences uh, as, as she used to say. Um, and, and, and what I wanted to do is to her, through her work to reclaim her for an, an, a form of, of a sociology of human rights which doesn't look at power and interests alone but looks at experience and memory and that human rights are not grounded in, 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 in a kind of theoretical language alone. If you look at, and then you, know, you, you, you know that very well, of course, if you, if, if, if you look at, at these books, the, the historical origins of human rights, then you have like Locke and then you have like uh, human nature and you have the French Revolution and, 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 and these theoretical writings and the rights of man and human rights are basically read together and are not distinguished. And, and, and what, I, what, what I try to do also in, in, in this book and in the other book, Human Rights and Memory, is, is, is to show that, first of all, that human rights is not the same as the rights of men. This is not a very original point, but that it emerges out after the uh, uh, World War II, and it is based on really on this dystopian experience. It is memory, but memory as a, as a concept which is concrete, anchored in what people experience. So it is, in that sense, uh, um, it is customary, but it's also more what happens, what, what, is, what is the sociological anchor of our moral outrage when we see on the internet or on the TV people being brutally treated by others, and we don't know these people, but we are morally outraged by it. Is this because we are some kind of moral heroes who are able to transcend ourselves into these universal beings and are outraged by injustice wherever it happens, or because it touches it touches a certain kind of sentiment which reminds us of that it could, in a way, happen to ourselves as well. And this is, I mean, when, when Arendt talked about the enlarged mentality and, and you know, sending my, my fantasy or my imagination to go visit other, other places, that we can put ourselves in other people's situation without becoming these other people. And this is what she actually did. I mean, I think that uh, uh, in, in many ways also in the, in, 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 in the study of human rights and also in the study, in, in the theoretical studies on, on, on Hannah Arendt, when you look at books about Hannah Arendt and human rights, they usually don't relate really to her life. 
And when you look at them in her life, studies on her life, they really don't relate on her theories. And, and what I try to do is to connect these things together. You know, she, 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 she never believed in, 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 in universalism. She had this, this article in 1932 uh, where she already uh, uh, sort of like uh, uh, rejected uh, uh, ju uh, emancipation and the enlightenment uh, uh, for the Jews and, and even reclaimed Helder for, for, for an understanding of Jewish history. That's basically the first article in the Jewish writings that, that, that opens the volume. And that connects her very much with Salo Baron, who, who, who wrote this wonderful article in 1928, uh, Ghetto and Jewish Emancipation, where, ba where he writes basically, and Arendt would have completely agreed with him, that emancipation was bad for the Jews. And that uh, uh, the Middle Ages and the life in Jewish ghettos was actually good for the Jews. And he does this in a very provocative way because he says that emancipation was bad for the Jews because it individualized them and made them helpless. It, it, it sort of like prevented them to think in, in ways of solidarity and politically and they were turned into individuals which made them help. And Arendt would have completely agreed with them. This is where I sort of like connect the sociological dots. One small comment, which I think is it's very interesting. You know, I think Shema Ben Aviv in an article long ago, 1990, talks about building Arendtian ideas of human rights through storytelling. Mm -hmm. And um, in a way, storytelling would be an Arendtian version of your sociological human rights. Exactly. It's, it's, it, it, Instead of speaking a language she wouldn't speak of sociology, it was storytelling. Yeah, I mean, what is... I think what you're saying is exactly that. So you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, what is good sociology? It's storytelling. <laughs> this, is, that, this is what sociology is all about. I and mean, this is what I'm trying to tell my, my students, you know, like, like, like her, you know, forget theory. Tell a good story, you know. <laughs> this, is good, this is good sociology. And, and this is, of course, not a good story. It's a tragic story. But it's through these tragic stories that these things uh, uh, emerge. Thanks for your talk. So would you mind maybe telling us a story about how you think Hannah Arendt's right to have rights gets authorized, right? Because as you're saying, it's not authorized by some universal notion of human nature, and it also, as you just said, can't be authorized by this international protection since it lacks a sovereignty. So how does your sociological story tell us how the rights to have rights gets initiated for those who don't have the right to have yeah. rights? Yeah, how did you know to put your finger exactly into, in, in, into that really weak spot of her, I think, in, in, in her thinking? I mean... Well, I've read Rancière. Huh? <laughs> I've read Rancière's review. <laughs> This this is this this is exactly uh, uh, this is exactly the, the this is this is the point where, where you know where she she moves between world and worldlessness and where she on the one hand uh, uh, has this critique of the Israeli state as 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 this the sovereignty that that that, that, that frightens her in in, in in many ways and and, and 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 she takes this critique from sovereignty I think in many ways from from her reading of Benjamin and, and, and Rosenzweig, when she translates this into, in, 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 into politics. And, and, and she has this, this utopian notion of like this, this, this uh, minorities working jointly together in order to, to protect themselves. And, and, and at the same time, she knows it doesn't work. At the same time, she, she really knows it, 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 it doesn't work. And, 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 and she confronts. Uh, um, she confronts the, 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 the helplessness of, of the Jews in, 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 in a very strange way. When she wrote 1941, the Jews should form an army in order to fight the Nazis. Um, this is, in, in, in a way, 1941. I mean, this, 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 is, this, is, this is a fantasy. How could the Jews uh, 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 form an army at, the, at that particular time? But she wanted somehow, she rejected, and I think this is part of what, what she still writes this again when she writes in, in Eichmann in, 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 in Jerusalem, when she, when she, when she writes this, this so, so full of anger against the Jewish councils that without them it could never have happened, and how could the Jews be so, so uh, uh, helpless in, in, in many ways like uh, uh, many right-wing nationalists in Israel are, 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 are claiming very, very similar ways. It's no, it's no coincidence that when she wrote about the Jewish army that, that people like Ben Hecht in New York and Peter Bergson and all these 
uh, uh, revisionist Jews were contacting her and she got completely, no, no, I, I didn't mean you. But, uh, uh, and, and, and because it was these, this, this kind of right-wing nationalist thinking that tried to connect to what she was saying, but she always backed down from that. And then she became this like more Benjaminian, Rosenzweigian kind of thinker, which sort of like connected back to the worldlessness and that the Jews should not be tempted by sovereignty, but should be tempted by some kind of, of federal thinking. And, and, and Scholen, uh, uh, that she, 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 she sort of corresponded with him about these issues in, in, in a letter when, when, when he responded to her Zionism reconsidered in 1945. He, he told her, why do you think that the Jews should be the only ones who should have this like moral claim of being beyond sovereignty? Why, why only the, should the Jews be? I mean, this is like, why should we be, again, like this, this slide onto the nations and, and, and all that? This is, this is not really thinking politically. And, 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 and she was torn because she was like hardcore political thinking on the one hand. And then at, 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 at the same time, she could be a completely apolitical uh, 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 a, a thinker who, who really couldn't deal with issues of sovereignty and power and how to translate power, even though she wrote about a Jewish army. So you put exactly your finger on it. This, this, is, this is like a huge contradiction in her thinking. And I think that this, this, this kind of tension is exactly the tension of what we see today when we talk about uh, uh, in, uh, international interventions. Should the Americans intervene in Syria? Should they not? Should they do? If they do, they're damned. If they don't, they're damned. That this is like exercising power and interest. But if they don't, then you know we allow these awful things to happen all over the world. And it's exactly that tension that, that she pointed the finger on in, in, in those. And I don't think she has, she has an answer to that. Because once she says it's the state that can provide the authority, and once she said, no, the state cannot be uh, uh, the answer. So what's left? The tension, <laughs> in many ways. So she doesn't have an answer, neither do we, I think. This is, this is like one of the dilemmas, I think, when we talk today about cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan interventionism and, and, and all that. I mean, certainly it's not the Finns who can intervene in international conflict. It's only powers like the US. And if they do it, they don't do it for the moral reasons. They do it for power reasons. Yeah, you know the argument. Yeah, just a question. So then, you know, the problem we discuss seems to kind of, it seems like she wouldn't be capable of addressing the problem of human rights in the israel Palestine conflict today. Because we have two conflicting kind of baby states sort of fighting over the right to exist. Mm -hmm. And so how would she <laughs> she did in 1944. I mean, she wrote this article, Zionism Reconsidered. Uh, do you know that, 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 that piece by, by any chance? So it's, 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 it's republished also in, in, the, in, the, in the Jewish writings. It's when she reacted to, uh, to the Baltimore Conference in New York when the Zionist organization decided they're going to go for the sovereignty concept. And she said, you know, if Israel will become sovereign, it, it creates this huge uh, problem of Palestinian refugees. Israel will become militarized. It will be dependent on, on the superpowers for the rest. It will destroy its, its, uh, its, its moral fiber. All kinds of weird things she wrote in 1944. And it's often quoted by people, oh, she knew. She knew already then. <laughs> And uh, uh, on the other hand, again, like Sholem wrote her back to that, to that article, what is it you want? I mean, the Arabs don't agree to, to any kind of uh, binational uh, uh, or federalist thinking. I mean, if you read through other articles she wrote in that time, she, she thought that the best solution would be that the British would uh, provide the imperial umbrella and that the Jews and the Arabs would live as autonomous uh, 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 communities under the umbrella of uh, British imperialism. 
I mean, I think if you, if you would put her on the spot, I think that would have been the solution she would have preferred. Sort of like, not sovereignty, but it needs an umbrella. Mm -hmm. And the umbrella was the British Empire. And uh, so, I mean, this is, this is why, she, I mean, she was not, in that sense, she really had no trouble with, like, with benign imperialism in that sense, especially when it came out of like, uh, Great Britain. But the, the, if, if, you would, if you would ask her in 45, 46, that would have been her solution. In, in, in 61, when she came to, to Jerusalem, she already looked at it a little bit uh, uh, differently. I mean, she, she, she was then too much of an American to, uh, uh, to appreciate the ethnic national project of uh, what Israel has become in, 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 the, in the early 1960s. I mean, this is, for her, America was basically the, the solution for the Jewish problem, not, not Israel. For Jews to go to America? Pardon me? For Jews to go to America? She didn't, uh, she didn't go, so the, all the Jews should come to America, but I think that uh, for her it was, I mean, for her personally it was clear. And, and, and what she wrote in, in those days, that it was clear that, that the United States was for her like the, 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 ideal, the ideal space where Jews could be, live as American citizens and as Jews uh, at the same time. I mean, if, if, if you read, for instance, uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem together with On Revolutions, which were basically written at, the same, at that same time, and, and, and On the Revolutions is that, you know, French universalism is bad because it homogenizes, it universalizes, and it has betrayed the Jews. I mean, she was obsessed with the French betrayal of the Jews more than she was basically bothered by the German betrayal of the Jews almost. I mean, it was the French revolutionary spirit which betrayed the Jews. But what could save the Jews is American pluralism. And here's the place where Jews can be Jews. I mean, she was, she was really in, in, in that. And, and Israel is not, is, is, it was for her, uh, even though she was, she was very much troubled by what was going on there. I mean, her, her embrace of America is an embrace of uh, a country, a sovereign country without sovereignty. Yeah. Um, in the sense that she found that America, the great genius of America, was to, uh, through federalism mm -hmm. and through uh, dispersal of powers, not separation of powers, but yeah. dispersal of powers, uh, create a, a system in which no single sovereign power could become total, totalitarian. And that's good for the Jews, she thought. And she, and she thought that was good for the Jews. Um, which is her critique of Israel. She, she yeah. wanted Israel to be more like America. Yeah. Um, to be a, 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 a federal, not just a pluralist, but a federal mm -hmm. republic where Palestinians and, and Israelis could have separate power bases. If yeah. Um, and, 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 and this goes back to the question that you and Grace were talking about with the uh, the right to have rights. I mean, the rights that she ha says we have a right to is not what we typically think of human rights, right? It's, it's not life, it's not happiness, it's not food even. It's the right to, to speak belong. and act in public. Yeah, and to it's belong. Right, and to be part of a community. Yeah. Um, it's, for her, the right to have rights is the right to be human, which means not to live, but to be political. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I don't think it's un, I think it's only a contradiction in her writing when we look at today human rights and think right to life, right to food, right to et cetera. But when we think of it in a Arendtian sense of right to action, right to belong, and right to speak and act in public, it actually makes quite a lot of sense. Well, the, the, the question of authorizations, like how do, you, how do you speak to that even when you change the definition of rights? Like how does it then get authorized? You mean enforcement, no, by authorization? Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I agree with Roger's point about what she means there by rights, but we still have the problem of what does I think I think what Grace is asking, if I'm, if I'm, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this, is that for in my reading of RN, the rights are authorized in the sense they come from um, what it means to be human, 
not in a biological or natural sense, but in the idea of to be human means to belong to a community, to belong mm -hmm. to a world. And, and if that's the case, there's a ground for human rights in the human condition, which is why she writes the human condition right after the origins of self-terrorism. Yeah, but th there's also the point of, in, of institutionalized enforcement that, that is also important to her. And uh, how, how to translate this into praxis. I mean, how, how can it be in that sense, guaranteed by whom and, uh, and, and through it. means and through what means. I mean, this is, this is, this is, this is then the, the, the hardcore political question, not, not the theoretical question. And she moves. I mean, this is, I think, what, what's, what, what makes it so, so difficult because she, she moves back and forth between like hardcore politics and, 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 and this philosophical grounding in, 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 in the thinking of human rights. And I think this is part of what human rights thinking is so complicated even today because people who are into who, who, who want human rights to be enforced usually have to embrace principles which are in violation of their own minima moralia in, in, in that sense and I think that's, that, that's a huge problem <laughs> please <coughs> No, she was involved in Jewish politics, I would say, from 1933 till 90, 20 years, till, 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 till 50, 52, 53. And uh, just 20 years, I mean, that, 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 that's a long time. <laughs> and, and, and you're asking why she, yeah. why she stopped being, I think because she, I mean, I, you know probably better than I do, but I, I think because she became an American in that sense. I mean, that, that she didn't, after the, the work with Jewish cultural reconstruction was completed, and uh, the organization was disbanded in, in, in the 1950s, um, the State of Israel was founded, and she sort of like became, <coughs> she saw herself as an American who does not need any more this kind of, uh, of Jewish politics, and then it all break loose again when, when, when she was sent to Jerusalem to, to, to write this book. It's sort of like it, it came back then with a vengeance. When, and, and I think part of the problem is that she wrote that, that I mean, that, that's, that's my opinion. It's, uh, she wrote that book, um, I, I mean the Eichmann book, uh, still very much engaged in questions of Jewish minority politics at a time when this episode of Jewish minor minority politics was completely forgotten. And, uh, and I think that, that, that the, the, the Jewish reactions to that book were partly uh, uh, caused by, uh, uh, by the non-existence of the memory of that kind of Jewish minority politics in that, that, that she was so much that she was so much engaged, besides the fact that it was also confrontation between a refugee and a survivor, which is also a kind of different mode of experience which, which came across in that book very much. And this is what Sholem also told her, basically. I mean, you, you shouldn't talk like that because you weren't there. You are not a survivor in that sense. And, uh, and that's why your book is insensitive. But she wrote this book uh, as, as, as somebody who is engaged in Jewish politics and, and writing about this in, in, in that way, like it was written in, 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 in a different time period. So, and, and this is what, what exploded in her face. It was the time gap also, I mean, I, I think. I mean, this is, I mean, I have to think this through a little bit more, but I think this is, this is part of it. That, so she was never really stopping, I mean, the, on revolution, where I think the word Jew is not mentioned even once is, in my opinion, a very Jewish book as well. And it's, it's a homage of a Jewish refugee to America. Can you please talk more about, if, if human rights are grounded in memory, what, what particular kinds of memory can, can human rights be grounded in? Does it have to be catastrophe? 
in, yeah. in, in, in it's it's grounded in, in failure. Mm -hmm. It's grounded in in, 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 in in what happens when 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 they're not there, when when people are not protected. It's it's How that no, no, no. I mean, because in, in, in middle school, I remember being taught about the Holocaust, but not being taught about Pol Pot, and not being taught about, I guess now the, uh, the Red campaign is taught more in high schools now than it used to be. Mm -hmm. Why certain, are, are there certain kinds, of, I'm just curious how certain events, there's so many kinds of catastrophes, mm -hmm. so many examples. So why why this one and not not other one? I mean this I, I you don't want to you 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 don't want to get into the debate about the uniqueness of the Holocaust and that that that's that's not no I'm, no. Just, I'm just curious about what is like the particular qualities of a memory because this is a really huge task that it's fulfilling to ground human rights and memory. Yeah. I'm wondering what particular kinds of memories. Um, certain memories seem to be more salient. Of course, I mean, the memories who are blotted out a little bit more, but I don't think that memory is, uh, is, 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 is working on a, on a concept of waste energy, that uh, if you have a, a certain amount of memory of one, of one incident, then there isn't enough memory left for, for other incidents. I mean, there's this, there's this wonderful book that was published a couple of years ago by, um, by Michael Rothberg. Uh, multi-directional uh, multi -directional memory. memory. Mm -hmm. And I think he makes, a, he makes a, a, a brilliant argument, which uh, sort of like I, I would like to see is complementing my own argument about cosmopolitan memory, that, that different memories <coughs> are not in competition with each other, but basically reinforce each other. And he take, give, gives very uh, 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 different examples. He, he has this wonderful example about uh, um, the boys coming to the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial in 1951 and 1952, and writes this article then uh, when he comes back to the United States uh, called The Negro at the Warsaw Ghetto or something like that, where he writes about how these, the fates of these communities, how they're interrelated, and how Blacks can learn from Jews, and Jews can learn from blacks, and that there's no, and, and Rothberg takes this to see that this is not zero sum, as uh, you know, as in the po in the politics of memory in the last in the last years, uh, uh, some people have suggested that, that there's a Holocaust memorial uh, in Washington, but there's no memorial for slavery, and uh, uh, the, the, some groups are monopolizing memory and not leaving any more memory for others. What Rothberg is, is suggesting is that there's enough memory to go around for everybody in that sense, and that they, they, they're not competitive. They're not zero sum, they're some sum. And he talks about colonial memory, and he talks about uh, uh, black memory, and he talks about Jewish memory. And, and so, of course, I mean, it's, it's, it's important that these different kinds of, 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 of catastro catastrophes need to be taught, but they, 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 they're not like, it doesn't have to be in a competitive game in that sense, so that if we don't teach this, oh God, what will happen? But that they can be really uh, uh, complementary to, uh, to each other. It's a wonderful book. It's really, really an uh, uh, interesting argument, this multi-directional memory. Can I try to push um, John's question a little bit more? If, if human rights are grounded in the memory of failure, then it seems we would have had human rights a long, long time ago, <laughs> right? Because we've always had failure. We've had massive failures. Yeah. You know, so I guess, again, like, what is it that's particular about the memory of it, but also I mean, after, after World War II, it, 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 the major failure was in the framers of the human rights politics was the failure of minority politics, minority rights politics. They were horrified by, uh, 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 um, by we, by, by the failure of minority politics. Not only horrified, they saw it as, uh, as what happened in, 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 in Czechoslovakia and what happened in, in other places, they saw minority rights basically as one of the big causes of what 
happened in World War II. And, uh, um, and that it needed to be prevented. I mean, this is, this is, this is, and this is also why uh, uh, the Allies agreed on, uh, on ethnic homogeneity as, as the guarantee for, for stability and peace after the war. And, and if, so minority, minority <coughs> rights, and, and it's extremely interesting to see how, how Jewish organizations reacted to that after the war, because all these, all these people who were like uh, uh, engaged in Jewish politics and were here now, most either they were killed or they, they were in the, in, the, in the United States. And if you look at, at the politics of the Institute for Jewish Affairs, so all Eastern European Jews sort of like trying to formulate this new politics. They knew that they couldn't revive the minority politics anymore, minority rights. This was a failure. So if minority politics is part of the memory of failure, what comes into its place? And, 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 and Robinson, for instance, J Jacob Robinson gives the speech in London between uh, for in, in, in the end of 1945, where he speaks in front of the London Jewish congregation, where he said, the Nuremberg trials, they're an enormous chance for us, for us Jews. They're an enormous chance because we can use those <coughs> Nuremberg trials in the, through the language of human rights, we can finally come and outlaw anti-Semitism, to make anti-Semitism something that, that is, it will be against the law in, in, in international, in, in, in new international laws. This is what he, in October 1945, he gave that speech uh, 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 in London. And this is why the, 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 uh, all the American Jewish uh, organizations at that particular time, 45, 46, 47, com were so much supporting the uh, UN Convent, the UN Declaration for Universal Rights, because it was for them, basically, this new language based on the memory of failure of the of, of minority rights protection between, between worlds where most uh, Jewish organizations put so much uh, 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 belief and faith in, 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 that particular, in that particular kind of legislation. I mean, there was the Zionist perception which says only a sovereign state can save us, and then there was the, the transnational Jewish perception which says only a minority rights legislation which will give us the status of an autonomous cultural group, transnational, but we need, uh, we need to be protected. And the League of Nations, this brings us back to, to, to your point, the League of Nations had no enforcing mechanism. They were saying, you have to protect minority rights in Poland and in Czechoslovakia and in all those countries. And if you don't, we don't have an army, we can't enforce it, we can only say you should. And I think this, 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 this failure of the League of Nations to, to protect minority rights was, was really part of, of a, I mean, one of the framers of the universal rights legislation, René, uh, René Cassin, who was like this really uh, 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 strong uh, French Republican who happened to be a Jew. But after 45, he was not anymore a French Republican who happened to be a Jew, but he was a Jewish French man in that sense. And he always says, he always says that human rights is the only solution, not only for mankind, but for the Jews in that sense. And, uh, and uh, this is the, fa it's the failure of, of concrete failure of minority rights legislation between the wars which is a failure of what you mentioned, of uh, enforceability and authorization in that sense. OK. Any more? One question. OK. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>